I am here. Dr. Annette Ferovich. That's a good look, huh? <laughs> oh, I can smell the rain. Oh my gosh. If you just irons in a place where it rains a lot enough. We have had such a wonderful summer here in Michigan. It really has been unbelievable. It has rained every single night like this. I think except for maybe yesterday it didn't rain. In the last week, I would say. And and on and off like that for the whole summer. It really does do a great job watering the plants, which is why it doesn't make any sense that those plants would all be brown on the top except for nefarious jerks. The sign of the beaver. I am actually getting to the point where I'm just like, what's up with all these titles of everything, right? I don't know, but it doesn't matter. This is a yearling Newberry book, which means it's a, it's a story that kids really like, and it's a, it's a um, story that's told that's age appropriate, but, you know, not to worry so much about what's, what's in there. So, um, it's a New York Times best book of the year. A sturdy, never faltering story of wilderness survival. The story has flow and pace, good style, and that careful but unobtrusive research that marks the best historical fiction. I like that. Distinguished in style and compelling in narrative force, as, as usual in Mrs. Spears' novels, each word rings true. Hmm. No pictures, a chapter book. So our first real chapter book. No, we had the, the, le the lemming, whatever. That was a chapter book. This one I think is a little more serious. And a little more true. Matt stood at the edge of the clearing for some time after his father had gone out of sight among the trees. There was just a chance that his father might turn back, that perhaps he had forgotten something or had some last word of advice. This was one time Matt reckoned he wouldn't mind the advice, no matter how many times he had heard it before. But finally he had to admit that this was not going to happen. His father had really gone. He was alone with miles of wilderness stretching on every side. He turned and looked back at the log house. It was a fair house, he thought. His mother would have no cause to be ashamed of it. He had helped to build every inch of it. He had helped to cut down the spruce trees and haul the logs and square and notch them. He had stood at one end of every log and raised it, one on top of the other, fitting the notched ends together as snugly as though they had been grown that way. He had climbed the roof to fasten down the cedar splints with log poles and dragged up pine bows to cover them. Behind the cabin were the mounds of corn he had helped plant, the green blades already shooting up, and the pumpkin vines just showing between the stumps of trees. If only it were not so quiet. He had been alone before. His father had gone into the forest to hunt for hours on end. Even when he was there, he was not much of a talker. Sometimes they had worked side by side through a whole morning without his speaking a single word. But this silence was different. It coiled around Matt and reached into his stomach to settle there in a hard knot. He knew it was high, high time for his father. He knew it was high time his father was starting back. This was part of the plan that the family had worked out together in the long winter of 1768, sitting by lamplight around the pine table back in Massachusetts. His father had spread out the surveyor's map and traced the boundaries of the land he had purchased in Maine Territory. They would be the first settlers in a new township. In the spring, when that, that ice melted, Matt and his father would travel north. They would take passage on a ship to the settlement at the mouth of the Penobscot, Penobscot River. There they would find some man with a boat to take them up the river and then on a smaller river that branched off from it many days distance from the settlement. Finally, they would strike out on foot into the forest and claim their own plot of land. 
They would clear a patch of ground, build a cabin, and plant some corn. In the summer, his father would go back to Massachusetts to fetch his mother and sister and the new baby, who would be born while they were gone. Matt would stay behind and guard the cabin and the corn patch. It hadn't been quite so easy as it had sounded back in their house in Quincy. John Quincy Adams, that's where he was from as well. Matt had had to get used to going to sleep at night with every muscle in his body aching, but the log house was finished. It had only one room. Before winter, they would add a loft for him and his sister to sleep in. Inside, there were shelves along one wall and a sturdy puncheon table with two stools. One of, one of these days, his father promised, he would cut out a window and fasten oiled paper to let in the light. Someday the paper would be replaced by real glass. Against the, the wall was a chimney of smaller logs, daubed and lined with clay from the creek. This too was a temp temporary structure. Over and over his father had warned Matt that it wasn't safe as sto at, it wasn't as safe as a stone chimney. Uh oh, those are my mats. I got oh, those are my um cushions that fell in the rain. I don't want my cushions in the rain. Hold on. Oh, and now it's cooling down from the rain, like so cool. I have to shut the door. Oh, I hope those don't fall over again, because then I have to put them behind the ladder, and that takes more time, and it was cold out there. Holy smokes. Excuse me. these little things from my dress yesterday. I woke up with them all over me. It hadn't been quite so easy as, as it had sounded back in their house in Quincy. Matt had had to get used to going to sleep at night with every muscle in his body aching, but the log house was finished. It had only one room. Before winter, they would add a loft for him and his sister to sleep. Inside, there were shelves along one wall and a sturdy punchian table with two stools. One of these days, his father promised he would cut out a window and fasten oil paper to let the light, to let in the light. All right, let's keep going. Six weeks, his father had said, that morning, maybe seven. Hard to reckon exactly. With your mom and sister, we'll have slow going, especially with the new little one. You may lose track of the weeks, he added. All right, I'm gonna, I, I actually stepped in the middle of that paragraph. I thought I read the paragraph. Over and over, his father had warned Matt that it wasn't safe, as safe as a stone chimney and that he had to watch out for flying sparks. He needn't fear. After all the work of the building of building this house, Matt wasn't going to let it burn down about his ears. Six weeks, his father had said that morning, maybe seven, hard to reckon. With your mom's sister, we'll have slow going, especially with the new little one. You may lose track of the weeks, he added. Easy thing to do when you're alone. Might be well to make notches on a stick, seven notches to a stick. When you get to the seventh stick, you can start looking for us. A silly thing to do, Matt thought, as though he couldn't count the weeks for himself, but he wouldn't argue about it. Ugh. Not on that last morning. They fell down again. Give me a sec. I really don't want them being wet. So now I have to get them into, behind the, behind the whatever.
Okay. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Look at. Oh, it is pouring out there, but I'm glad I did that because I don't want my cushions to be. Lucy! No! My delicious coffee, she's drinking. Don't do that. No. Just because I put it up there doesn't mean it's more convenient. Okay. I do, but I don't like it glaring in the window there. Let's hear the rain a little bit. Then his father reached up to a chink in the log wall and took down the battered tin box that held his watch and his compass and a few silver coins. He took out the big silver watch. Every time you cut a notch, he said, remember to wind this up at the same time. Matt took the watch in his hand as gently as if it were a bird's egg. You aim to leave it, Pa, he asked. It belonged to your grandpa. Would have belonged to you anyhow sooner or later. Might as well be now. You mean it's mine? I... It's your be kind of company hearing it tick. The lump in Matt's throat felt as big as the watch. This was the finest thing his father had ever possessed. I'll take care of it, he managed finally. I, I knowed you would. Mind you don't wind it up too tight. Then just before he left, his father had given him a second gift. Thinking of it, Matt walked back into the cabin and looked up at his father's rifle, hanging on two pegs over the door. I'll take your old blunderbuss with me, his father had said. This one aims truer. But mind you, don't go banging away at everything that moves. Wait till you're dead sure. There's plenty of powder if you don't waste it. It was the first sign he had given that he felt uneasy about leaving Matt here. Matt wished now that he could have said something to reassure his father instead of standing there tongue-tied. But if he had the chance again, he knew he wouldn't do any better. They just weren't a family to put things into words. It's kind of like a lot of families, right? He reached up and took down the rifle. It was lighter than his old matchlock, the one his father had carried away with him in exchange. This was a fine piece, the walnut stock as smooth and shining as his mother's silk dress. It was a mite long, but it had a good balance. With this gun, he wouldn't need to waste powder, so it wouldn't hurt to take one shot right now just to try the feel of it. He knew his father always kept the rifle as clean as a new polished spoon, but because he enjoyed handling it, Matt poked about in the touch hole with the metal pick. From the powder horn, he shook a little of the black powder into the pan. Then he took one lead bullet out of the pouch, wrapped it in a patch of cloth, and rammed it into the barrel. As he worked, he whistled loudly into the stillness and made the knot in his stomach loosen a little. As he stepped into the woods, a blue jay screeched a warning. So it was some time before he spotted anything to shoot at. Presently, he saw a red squirrel hunched on a branch with its tail curled up behind his ears. He lifted the rifle and sighted along the barrel, minding his father's advice and waiting till he was dead sure. The clean feel of the shot delighted him. It didn't set him back on his heels like his old matchlock. Still, he hadn't quite got the knack of it. He caught the flick of a tail as the squirrel scampered to an upper branch. I could do better with my own gun, he thought. This rifle of his father's was going to take some getting used to. Ruefully, he trudged back to the cabin. For his noon meal, he sat munching a bit of Johnny cake his father had baked that morning. Already he was beginning to realize that time was going to move slowly. A whole afternoon to go before he could cut that first notch. Seven sticks. That would be August. He would have a birthday before August. He supposed his father had forgotten that with so many things on his mind. By the time his family got here, he would be 13 years old. Chapter 2 By the next morning, the tight place in his stomach was gone. By the morning after that, Matt, Matt decided it was mighty pleasant living alone. He enjoyed walking to a day stretched before him to fill as he pleased. 
He could set himself the necessary chores without having to listen to any advice about how they should be done. How could he have thought that the time would move slowly? As the days passed and he cut one notch after another on a stick, Matt discovered that there was never time enough for all that, he, that must be done between sunrise and sunset. Look at how beautiful it is out there, right? Although the cabin was finished, his father had left him the endless task of chinking the spaces between the logs with clay from the creek bank. At the edge of the clearing, there were trees to, to fell to let in more sun on the growing corn and underbrush that kept creeping closer and, clear, and cleared, creeping closer over the cleared ground. All this provided plenty of wood to be chopped and stacked in the wood pile against the, wall, uh, against the cabin wall. To cook a meal for himself once or twice a day, he had to keep a fire going. Twice in the first few days, he had waked and found the ashes cold. Back home in Quincy, if his mother's fire burned out, she had sent him or Sarah with her shovel to borrow a live coal from a neighbor. There was no neighbor here. He had to gather twigs and make a wad of shredded cedar bark, then strike a flint and blow on the tiny spark until it burst into flame. A man could get mighty hungry before he had coaxed the, that spark into, cook, into a cooking fire. The corn patch needed constant tending. In these hot, bright days, every drop of water from these green shoots demanded that these green shoots demanded had to be lugged from the creek, a kettle full at a time, and there was no way to water the corn without encouraging the weeds as well. As fast as he pulled them, new ones sprang up. The crows drove him distracted, forever flapping about. A dozen, a dozen times a day, he would dash at them fiercely, shouting and waving his arms. They would just fly lazily off and wait on a nearby treetop till his back was turned. He dared not waste his precious powder on them. At night, wild cre creatures nibbled the tops of the green shoots. Once he sat up all night with his rifle across his knees, batting at the mosquitoes. When morning came, he stumbled into the cabin and slept away half the day. That was the second time he let the fire go out. He seemed to be hungrier than ever before in his life. The barrel of flour was going down almost as fast as when two were dipping into it. He depended on his gun to keep his stomach filled. He was still proud of that gun, but no longer in awe of it. Carrying it over his shoulder, he set out confidently into the forest, venturing farther each day, certain of bringing home a duck or a rabbit for his dinner. For a change of diet, he could take his fish pole and follow the twisting course of the creek or walk the trail his father had blazed to a pond some distance away. In no time, he could, he could catch all the fish he could eat. Twice he had glimpsed a deer moving through the trees just out of range of his rifle. One of these days, he promised himself he would bring one down. It was a good life with only a few small annoyances buzzing like mosquitoes inside his head. One of these was the thought of Indians. Not that he feared them. His father had been assured by the proprietors that his new settlement would be safe. Since the last treaty with the tribes, there had, been, there had not been an attack reported anywhere in this part of Maine. Still, one could not entirely forget all those hostile tales. And he just didn't like the feeling he had sometimes that someone was watching him. He couldn't prove it. He could never see anything more than a quick shadow that might be a moving branch. But he couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was there. One of these pieces of advice his father had been so fond of giving him had been about Indians. They won't bother you, he said. Most of them have left for Canada. But ones who stay don't want to make any trouble. But some Indians take great stock in politeness. Should you meet one, speak to him just the same as to the minister back home. Matt had seen his father follow his own advice. Once, when they had tramped a long way from the cabin, they had seen in the distance a solitary dark-skinned figure. The two men had nodded to each other gravely. Hello, Matt answered uncertainly. Was this someone who ought to be greeted like a deacon? The stranger came closer so that Matt could see the small blue eyes that, glint, that glinted in the weather-hardened face. The man stood deliberately taking his time, looking over the cabin and the cornfield. Nice place you got here. Matt said nothing. The, Matt, 
peered curiously over Matt's shoulder through the open door. He could easily see that the cabin was empty. You alone here? Matt hesitated. My father is away just now. Be back soon, Willie? Matt was puzzled by his own unwillingness to answer. He ought to be glad to see anyone after these days alone, but someone he wasn't. But somehow he wasn't. He didn't quite know why he found himself lying. Any time now, he said. He went back to the river to get supplies. He might be back tonight. When I saw you coming, I thought it was him. Guess I surprised you. Reckon you don't get much company way off here. No, we don't, Matt answered. Then your pappy wouldn't want you to turn away a visitor, would he? The man asked. Thought maybe you'd ask me to stay for supper. I got a whiff of it half a mile off. Matt remembered his manners. This man's easy grin was beginning to wipe away some of his doubts. Of course, he said. Come in, sir. The man snorted. Ben's the name, he said. You may have heard of me in the river town. We didn't stay in, in the town very long, Matt answered. He hurried now to keep, light a candle. The stranger stood inside the door, taking in every inch of the small room. Your pappy knows how to build a good, tight house, he said. <clears throat> you reckon on staying here for good? It's our land, Matt told him. In the candlelight, the room looked snug and homey. Something to be proud of, showing off to a stranger. My mother and sister will be coming soon. My, my, oh, tickle. More folks coming all the time, the man said. Time was you could tramp for a month and never see a chimney. Now the town is spreading out from the richer from the river every which way. His eye fell on the rifle hanging over the door. He let out a slow, admiring whistle and walked over to run his hand along the stock. Mighty fine piece, he said, worth the passel of beaver. My father wouldn't sell it, Matt said shortly. He was busying himself now to make this this stranger welcome. He scooped out a good measure of flour, stirred in some water, patted the dough out on a clean ash board, and propped it up in front of the fire to bake. He laid out the two bowls on the table and the two pewter spoons. He poured molasses into one pewter dish, then he ladled the hot stew into the bowls. The way the stew disappeared, the stranger couldn't have eaten a meal for a good while. Matt took a very small shear for himself. He pulled back his hand and watched the man snatch the last bit of corn cake, sopping up the last of the molasses with it. Finally, Ben pushed back his stool and drew the back of his hand across his beard. That was mighty tasty, son, mighty tasty. You would have a mite of tobacco now, would you? I'm sorry, Matt said. My father doesn't have any. Pity can't be helped, I suppose. In the easy silence that followed, Matt decided to ask a question of his own. Are you traveling to the river? Ben snorted again. Not likely. I'm keeping as fur as fur off from the, that river as I can till things quiet down. Matt waited. Tell the truth, I got away from that town just in time. Weren't nothing they could prove, but they sure had it in for me. So I says, Ben, I says, you've been planning on getting yourself some beaver pelts. Looks not like now's the time to get moving. I aim to settle in with the Redskins a bit, maybe move on north. You mean you're going to live with the Indians? Could do worse. I can bed down bout anywheres. It certainly looked as though, invited or not, Ben was planning on bedding down right here in the cabin. He had eased himself off the stool and sprawled out on the floor. His shoulders propped against the wall. He pulled a dirty corn cob pipe from his pocket and stared down at it ruefully. Pity, he said again. Meal like that needs a meal like that needs backy to settle it right. He put the pipe away and shifted his heavy bulk against the wall. When I was not much more in your age, he drawled, well fed and ready to talk, I'd spend the whole winter with the Redskins, hunt, em, hunt with them, trap, easy to pick up their lingo. Still remember a deal of it, but this country ain't the same anymore. You gotta go west, Ohio maybe, to get any decent trapping. The Indians still hunt here, don't they, Matt asked. The Indians has mostly cleared out of these parts, Ben told him. What wasn't killed off in the war got took with the sickness. A deal of them moved on to Canada. What left makes a mighty poor living game getting to scarce. Where do you live? Roundabout, Ben waved vaguely toward the forest. 
They make small camps for a while and then they move on. The pen the Tenopskets stick like burrs, won't give up. They still hunt and trap, no way to stop them. Never got it through their heads, they don't still own this land. You never seen none of them, eh? You never seen none of them, eh? My father did once. Do they speak English? Enough to get what they want, they pick it up from the traders. What pelts they can scrape together, they take into the towns. They can strike a sharp deal. You gotta know how to handle them. Reason you ain't seen them, he went on, they got enough sense to clear out of these parts when the bugs is bad. They move off the whole lot down to the coast to get their, this year's mess of clams. Should be moving back about now. They'll stay the summer and then go off for the big hunt come fall. Them hunts, he, he remembered, ain't nothing like them nowadays. Bows and arrows was all they had. Still use them some if they can't lay hands on a gun. I got so's I was demmed near as good as any of them. Don't suppose I could hit a barn door now. Ben's voice drawled on and on, thickened with food and drowsiness. He told of the big moose hunts of his day with Indians. He had fought in the recent war against the French, and he despised them for stirring up the Indians against the main settlements. He seemed to have single-handedly shot down half the French army. Especially he hated the Jesuit priests who had egged the Redskins on and he had once been part of the expedition that broke into a chapel and smashed the popish idols. Once he had been taken captive by the fierce Iroquois who were set on putting him to torture, but he had been too smart for them and escaped in the night. Listening, Matt couldn't make the man out. To hear him talk, he had been as big as hero as Jack the Giant Killer, but he didn't look the part. He had certainly fallen on hard times of late, no doubt about it. However, he could tell a good story. The man's voice was trailing off, and he slumped lower and lower. Presently, he was sprawled flat on the floor and snoring. It was very clear enough that he could bed down anywhere. At least he hadn't taken over Matt's bed. Matt moved about quietly, though he doubted anything could disturb his, disturb his guest. He cleared off the bowls of his twig brush with his twig brush. Then he banked with fires. He, then he banked the fires with ashes. Finally, he settled down on his hemlock mattress, but he couldn't sleep. He lay staring up at the log roof. Even after the last flickers of firelight had died away and the cabin was in darkness, he couldn't quite. He couldn't quiet his uneasy thoughts. Bragging about his adventures by the fire, Ben had seemed harmless, just a fat, tired old man, grateful for a good meal. To be honest, Matt had enjoyed his company. Now he began to worry. How long was Ben going to stay? He was sure to find out soon that Matt was living alone. When he did, would he decide it was more comfortable here than in an Indian village? At the rate he had wolfed down that supper, the flour and molasses wouldn't hold out long. Would he expect Matt to go on providing meals and waiting on him? And why had he left that town on the river in such a hurry? Was there really some charge against him? Was he dangerous, perhaps even a murderer? At the thought, Matt sat up on his pine bed. He'd been sensible to stay awake and on guard. He'd half a mind to fetch down his father's rifle and keep it near at hand. Then he felt ashamed. What would his father say about begrudging a stranger a meal and a night's rest? All the same, he was determined not to shut his eyes that night. He kept them open for a long time, but suddenly he jerked up out of a deep sleep and saw that daylight was streaming across the cabin floor. The cabin door was open and the man was gone. Perhaps he had only stepped outside. Matt stumbled to the door, no sign of the stranger. Relief flooded over him. All the worrying and the man had never intended to stay. Perhaps he had actually believed the lie that his father was returning that day. Then, once again, Matt felt ashamed. He must have made it easy, only too plain that Ben wasn't welcome. Would Pa say he did, had done wrong? Still, it was too early to be sure. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? At any moment, Ben might appear hungry for breakfast. He had better stir up some fresh corn cake. It was then that he noticed his father's rifle was not hanging over the door. In a panic, he searched a cabin, his own bed, the corner shelves under the table and the stools. He rushed back to the door, and on the edge of the forest, it was no use. No way of telling which way the man had taken or how long he had been on his way 
while Matt slept. Ben was gone, and so was the rifle. He should have kept it in his hands as his hunch had warned him. He could see now that the man had had his mind set on the gun from the moment he laid eyes on it, but even if Matt had had it in his hands, could he have held out against those burly arms? And to keep his gun, could he actually have shot a man, even a criminal? It was only later, when his rage began to die down, that he felt a prickle of fear. Now he had no protection and no way of getting meat. Sick with anger, he sat staring at the row of notched sticks. It would be a month at least before his father returned, a month of nothing but fish. And what would his father say? Good story so far. I think we're good. We're on chapter four. Oh, did we read chapter two? Oh, I skipped a page, is what I did. He was sitting on the flat stone that served as a doorstep waiting for his supper to cook, the late sun slanting in long yellow bars across the clearing. The forest beyond was already in shadow. Matt was feeling well pleased with his day. That morning he had shot a rabbit. He had skinned it carefully, stretching the fur against the cabin wall to dry. Chunks of the meat were boiling now in the kettle over the fire, and the good smell came through the door and made his mouth water. In the dimness of the trees, a darker shadow moved. This time it didn't disappear, but came steadily nearer. He could hear the crackle of twigs under heavy boots. Matt leaped to his feet. Pa? No answer. It wasn't his father, of course. It couldn't be. An Indian? Matt fell, felt a curl of alarm against his backbone. He stood waving his muscles, tensed. The man who came tramping out from the trees was not an Indian. He was heavy set, the fat bulging under a ragged blue army coat. His face was almost invisible behind a tangle of reddish whiskers. Halfway across the clearing, he stopped. Howdy, he called cheerfully. And that was the page I missed, which was chapter three. So we are already on chapter four. This is Dr. Nefarovich. That is, that's a pretty good story. I like reading and I like these kind of stories. I hope that you do too. I bet that you do. Dr. Anna we are here in the reading room. I'm the teacher. Thanks for joining me here in the classroom.